the Sunday Papers on Off The Ball. Welcome along, Joe Malloy with you this afternoon. We're looking through the Sunday papers. We'll start with the Sunday Independent. A picture of Sene Nwopu tackled yesterday at Donnybrook. Simply outclassed is the headline which pretty much captures Ireland 15, France 56 yesterday. And also beneath that, Pep denies he failed to give Cup due respect. Uh, the accusation being he made eight changes and therefore didn't take it seriously enough. But they were two and a half days on from Dortmund, so that's his response to that. Uh, the star then, they go with quad hike. Ziyech ends Pep's tilt at history books. And then above that, Paul Pogba. It's what I want. Uh, Paul Pogba says Harry Pratt here wants a whopping £500,000 a week sterling to sign <laughs> a new deal at Manchester United. Read the room, Paul. So he'd be Manchester United's highest paid player by a distance. Uh, it seems uh, Mino Raiola has let Real Madrid, PSG and Juventus know that that is the cost of Paul Pogba's services, half a million sterling per week. Uh, the Sun then, going with Chelsea's win against Manchester City. Sad Pep's four trophy dream is shattered and a beat that, uh, above that, excuse me, Ole title still on. Ole Gunnar Solskjaer believes Manchester United can still pull off title miracle. He says stranger things have happened. Sunday World, Klopp out, question mark. Essentially, this is owing to Hansi Flick confirming this weekend he is going to switch to the Germany job at the end of the year. So Kevin Palmer says that Bayern will test Klopp's loyalty to Liverpool. I'd be surprised if Klopp was tempted. Bayern is not really his uh, type of job, is it? He's more, he's more uh, well, underdog in so much as Liverpool are underdogs. Uh, Sunday Times... City Dream shot down. Chelsea Ziyech scores gold and Guardiola's hope of uh, quadruple and De Bruyne limps off as well. Also, they have England and Spurs fear over Kane ankle injury. Jonathan Northcroft. Kane's ankle has been just an ongoing thing. I can't remember when he first damaged his ankle, but every couple of games or every couple of months you see Kane go down. There was a game a while back and he went down and his ankle was really bad and he just plays on. I think he's one of those lads that now has an ankle that he rolls all the time and just has to deal with it. Uh, but they'll see how he is. They, basically, the swelling was uh, enormous and they had to wait for the swelling to go down and they're going to run a scan today. So that's where Harry Kane is. The Observer, they go with uh, Ziyech as well, celebrating. This is uh, Chelsea's 1-0 win yesterday. Chelsea were good. I know Man City obviously are getting criticised and Pep is criticised for his team selection, but I thought Chelsea were excellent. Really, really good. And they'll be in the hunt for Champions League, I suspect. And then uh, the Mail... Your quad's gone. And again, it's Zeke celebrating Chelsea triumph and Pep uh, fires back at critics. Oh, beneath that, Peter Canavan. Uh, Philip Lanigan has a very good interview with Peter Canavan inside. Uh, Peter Canavan turning 50 was the hook for it. But one of the newsworthy worthy lines is that Canavan says, I know other counties have been training. I mean, shock horror, say, say the rest of you. But uh, Peter Canavan here says, I know Tyrone aren't, that's are not, one of the teams that have been training I'm well aware where there are teams that haven't been caught that have trained together. Most people would say there's a lot of hearsay, but I know teams have been training together. But he says, not happening in Tyrone. So that is where we are. Johnny Ward, racing journalist, is with us. Brendan O'Brien from the Irish Examiner as well. Gents, you're both very welcome. Hi, lads. Good morning, Joe. Just to start with that back page on the Sunday Independent, Ireland, Brendan given a reality check I think that tends to be the uh, phrase that's used across the board here you know Shane McGrath in the Mail on Sunday Ireland 15 France uh, 56 he says even allowing for a two tier six nations this was a thoroughly demoralising beating and it was really lots of self-inflicted pain and then plenty dished out by France to boot and the gulf there is huge isn't it it is, yeah. I mean, um, you know the self-inflicted part is absolutely absolutely true you know there's a couple of the the early tries in the first half that you just look at and you go, this is not the game you need to be doing that. You need everything to be going really well. But self-inflicted or not, you take them away. They were still looking at a 22, 23-point beating, you know, if those little margins had gone their way. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of talk during the week from the Irish team on the back of that um, defeat of Wales, 45 million Cardiff last week, that, you know, they weren't, they weren't picking themselves up, but they were, you know, we've trained brilliantly, we're as fit as we ever were. Um, they completely battled away all questions about the two tier six nations and you know the gap between the semi-pro French and the professional English and maybe now we know why. I mean, 
Um, reality check is exactly what it is. And um, Brendan Fanning's piece on page eight of the Sunday uh, Indo um, sports section is very good and he puts it into perspective by z zeroing in on a couple of players. And he mentions uh, Rose Bernardou and um, Claire Joyeux, who are two tight heads. Um, the first of them being um, a, a colossal, I mean, it was... It was it was mentioned in commentary yesterday by Hugh Cowell and I think Fiona Coughlin. They were, they were saying just how physically big and powerful the French tight head was. And Brendan compares these girls who have come through playing rugby from seven, eight years of age, going up against um, a Lindsay Peace, who's 40 years of age and has had a fantastic career in basketball and GA. Um, but the whole 10,000 hours thing, so many of that Irish team have made a transfer from basketball and Gaelic football and other sports and um, they're amateur, the French are semi-pro. So, you know, you look at those kind of things and, you know, that's not to take away from what the Irish players have done by, by crossing over. You know, they're, they're a fantastic bunch, mm. but it really does put into perspective, you know, it's amateur against semi-pro um, and it really does kind of put the focus back on, on, on the IRFU now. I mean, where do we go with the women's game in this country? Um, I would say there's a moral case of we have to get to a, a case, uh, um, a situation where they are semi-pro. They have to be given a chance. I mean, you're just putting them out as cannon fodder against an England or a France or a New Zealand or a USA down the line. Like the moral case, and this is across a lot of sports now, are female athletes. To be the best, they have to have the best conditions that the rest have as well. And they don't currently have that. Yeah, Shane McGrath picks up that point in the mail as well. The Welsh are dreadful. This is a championship shaped by professionalism. That means there are only two countries that can compete for this championship until other unions react. And given the carnage wrought by COVID-19, there are plenty of reasons for them not to do so. But there is a future for this team and this sport on a level playing field, and it's up to the Irish Rugby Union to even it out. It won't be easy or quick, but it will require investment and support and trying to absorb what nourishment there is in a defeat like this. So... That's Ireland and rugby, and they play Italy next weekend in Donnybrook. Now, that game has been moved from Parma for COVID reasons, so they have a chance to at least finish third in the championship, which wouldn't be all bad. Well, Joe, just on before you move on, yeah. I mean, we had a situation earlier um, a month or so ago. CJ Stander is, is, is retiring pretty much unexpectedly. Um, you know, what's CJ Stander? I don't know, but, you know, an average central contract, what, three or 400,000 euros... I mean, the best player in the English squad, Emily Scar, is reportedly on £30,000. So that's one professional men's contract. Um, that could cover an awful lot of the women's game. And, and we've had a lot of, you know, um, pundits talking about how professionalism isn't the only answer. It goes a lot deeper than that. But that's one professional contract for, for mm. men's rugby. We go an awful long way towards that women's team. Yeah, that's a fair point. Uh, Johnny, another uh, sporting organisation that needs to get its act together is the FAI. So I'm going <coughs> to hold this up here. This is the Post Plus, and it's a picture of the Irish team returning from Italia 90. The headline is after the goal rush. And it's David Snaid here, uh, two pages in the Post Plus, given, I think, a really good sense of where Irish football is and what it's trying to do across pages two and three here, I appreciate lots of listeners will be saying, oh my God, no, not more grassroots talk and not more Irish football talk. So we won't spend all day in it, but it's a very good piece and it gave me a really good sense of where grassroots football is in the country and what we're trying to do and where the FAI are trying to get to over the next uh, number of years. 2025 is when they say we're going to really see the fruits of all this. So uh, give us a sense of the piece from your perspective or what aspect of the piece you want to focus on. Yeah, I actually spoke to David this morning and I think his line was something of, of the effect of, you know, it's 3,000 words, but it could be 6,000 words and we still wouldn't have the answer. And I think, and I'm not doing the piece of disservice here, you'll read this piece and you won't be much wiser and you may not be any wiser as to what Irish football does to sort itself out because there just isn't an easy answer here. It is such a complex issue and... Um, it's kind of convenient to make, you know, John Delaney sort of that era sort of a scapegoat because, and, and that's referenced in the piece that, you know, resources weren't really kind of managed properly and whatever. And um, we are where, we're, where we are now because of a dysfunctional Irish football family. Um, but there's a lot more to it than that. Um, you know, he references the Jack Charlton documentary. And I think, you know, 
any of us who watched that couldn't but be moved, um, not only by the, you know, the dementia of Jack Charlton, but also by a sense of nostalgia. And he says, psychologists say nostalgia has greater appeal when the current situation is bad, and right now it's very bad. The failure on the stage of international football runs deeper, starting at the fault lines of Ireland's sporting structure that could take years to repair. Um, and he talks to people in in the kind of the likes of the Belvedere's and the Kevins, as well as League of Ireland personalities like, say, um, Gerald Bryan at St. Pat's, who would be quite strong on the um, League of Ireland clubs being the right place, I suppose, for the development of the game in this country. Um, and Ger makes the point that, you know, it's, it is best practice around Europe. My question would be name any other top league in Europe or world football that the league clubs don't have academies. It shows how far we are behind in this country. This should have happened a hell of a long time ago. And that's absolutely right. So the League of Ireland didn't really have proper underage structures. And Ireland relied upon, um, you know, the likes of Belvedere, Kevin's Home Farm, Cherry Orchard and these clubs or whatever, um, Joey's to produce the players um, that would go on to England. And there's an interview with Vinnie Butler who would have co-founded Belvo. And the Belvo's success in bringing... Um, forward Irish internationals is quite staggering here and the figures are mentioned but Belvo are now kind of in in a tricky situation because obviously the FEI through Dotker and its development has placed the emphasis on the League of Ireland clubs to produce the young players so the likes of Belvo um, Kevins and so forth they're in they're in a in a, in a totally different different situation um, Kevins have obviously teamed up with Bowes and um, there's an interview with um with Alan Caffrey, who who is now um, involved with Shells as sporting and technical director, but he would have had a, a background also coming through from uh, the non-league. And he says, I refer to the Braveheart scene um, of the landscape in underage football. It's like fighting clans and everybody wants that little bit more power than the other and they'll stab each other in the back to get it. They certainly won't work together. Where are we now? We're kind of in a bit of a no-man's land. It's toxic. The SFAI, the FAI, and the leagues fighting against each other. And obviously then there's the background of the, the trimmed FAI board. Um, and there's an interview with John Early who would have he would have been involved in the old regime and and, and he, he departed. He uh, chairman of the Schoolboy Football Association, um, which is uh, the umbrella body for regional leagues with 900 clubs around the country. He resigned from the FAI board in the wake of the John Delaney stuff in 2019. Um, the SFI, FAI has now put forward two motions of no confidence through Dotker. Um, so there's a lot going on. Um, obviously, the FAI is trimmed down, but I think this piece does a very good job because it speaks mm. to, say, Jack Byrne and Stephen Bradley. Stephen Bradley, I mean, there's great, great lines, a really good anecdote about how... Um, Alex Ferguson came over to um, basically sign up Bradley and uh, Alex Ferguson was due at the house in 15 minutes. Bernadette Bradley was beginning to worry, but not because the Manchester United manager was on his way. They were well acquainted by this point. Bernadette from Jobstown in Tala was already on first name terms with the three men in charge of the biggest football clubs in England, as well as Ferguson, Arsenal, Arsenal's Arsene Wenger and Liverpool's Jared Houllier were in regular contract, contact. It was 1999 and Stephen, her 15-year-old son, was the most sought-after prospect in Ireland. This was the year United did the treble and Ferguson has always had one eye on the future. He wanted Bradley, a gifted midfielder, to be part of it at Old Trafford, but as Ferguson got closer to the house, there was still no sign of Stephen. He was on a street nearby playing football. Hmm. That's a lovely anecdote in itself because I remember talking to um, Johnny McDonnell about when when he was involved in Belvo and he, he asked um, the Belvo under 15s how many of them had a football at home and only half of them had. So the, the days of the street footballer is kind of gone and that, that Bradley story actually belongs to another era. But it also belongs to another era in the sense of Bradley um, got a profession contract by 16. He was a millionaire by 18. Now, that is that is staggering, but in the sense of the Irish footballers who now come through, and David references this, we have become an absolute irrelevance in the Premier League. The days of the Charlton days where the Liverpool team and Man United with Roy Keane, you know, it was it was, it was was um, very common for Irish players to have a big role in the Premier League. That's completely gone now, and we've gone massively down the pecking order in a globalised league. And you can read this piece and come up with the fact that there is a solution, there might be five solutions, there might be no solution, hmm. but you know that we're not in a good place. Yeah, it's a very fair piece. It doesn't take sides. And so the genesis of where we are now is this player development plan in 2015. That's when this was all kicked off. Wim Kuvermans was in. 
And now Rude Doctor has picked up the baton. And so we have an under 17s, under 15s, under 19s and under 13s National League. As you said, Johnny, the best young players are now going to League of Ireland clubs. And David talks to all sides. So as you mentioned, Ger O'Brien, who's with St. Pat's, he's their academy director. He's saying this is absolutely the way we have to go. As you said, name any other top league in Europe or world football where the main league clubs don't have academies. And David Snade in his piece here points out last Friday week, the FAI and Doctor got a glimpse of the future. This is what they want happening. This exact situation where 18-year-old Dara Burns scored St. Pat's second goal in a 2-0 win over Derry City. It was the teenager's first senior goal and came after his promotion from the under-19s National League where he'd scored the winner against Bohemians in last season's final. So that is the FAI dream here. Someone like a Dara Burns playing underage for St. Pat's and then mm. a smooth pathway, which we've never had a smooth pathway through to League of Ireland football. And, and for them, that is the vision. But then you have Vincent Butler, as you said, of um, Belvedere, you know, 230 Irish internationals through Belvedere. And he's sitting there over uh, a coffee at Glasnevin Cemetery. It's almost appropriate he's at a cemetery. Yeah. And, you know, he's saying, like, we're goosed here. He said, the FAI are systematically destroying a club like Belvedere. It makes no sense. We have had no under-14 or 15 team in 2020 or 2021 seasons will have no 14s, 15s or 16s in the coming seasons. He says the League of Ireland are taking 480 12-year-old boys at their next intake. That's astonishing. There's nowhere near that number of players who would be in any circumstances elite, particularly at 12 years of age. And you have uh, John Early from the Schoolboys Association saying, you know, there needs to be somebody who understands the kids here want to play football, GEA, rugby, other sports, instead of having to decide at 12 to go into a League of Ireland Academy and, and on it goes. And, mm-hmm. and the other point, Johnny, and this is maybe a key point, and Brian Kerr, I thought, hinted at this in the fallout of the Luxembourg game. It comes down to money. So you have oh. Vinnie Butler there and you have Belvedere who have a track record and you have these League of Ireland clubs who have never been the most stable of entities. No. And is there enough money? So David Snade estimates to run the four League of Ireland underage teams, as in 13s, 15s, 17s and 19s, to run those four teams... That's a cost of minimum 70 grand a year, more realistically, 140 grand a year. So let's call what it... What did you think when you read that, Joe? Uh, I thought about 100 grand a year. I could see how, yeah, each team would cost 25 grand a year. Yeah, well, my, 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 when I'm reading that, it's like 70 grand a year to run these teams or whatever, 140. This is absolutely tiny money. Like, well, yeah, no, it's very doable. But, Do you know what I mean? But then David later it's says, David later says, the brutal truth, and this, I think, is where Brian Kerr was coming from, the brutal truth is that League of Ireland clubs are chasing their tail with the demands now placed on them by the FAI. They get annual support of ten and a half grand per club from the FAI, and then they'll get forty to fifty grand from UEFA. So let's call that sixty grand. Now, if it's going to cost one hundred and forty, or certainly a minimum of seventy, there's already a shortcoming there, and you just wo- you just worry in ten or fifteen years' time, will David Smade be writing the piece? why the League of Ireland clubs were ill-equipped to bring the next generation through. And we're hearing mm. horror stories of not enough footballs or not enough kit or not enough time or not enough money for coaches. Like, we need to be damn sure here, the government, the FAI need to be damn sure here that the League of Ireland clubs can bring the players through and they're resourced enough to do it. The, you made a good point there about how layered this piece is and how it doesn't necessarily take sides. And just before that piece that you uh, read out there, those couple of sentences... He quotes Liam Carney, uh, who would have been involved with Bowie United last season with John Crawford. He's now gone back with Cork. And the big thing is to have people here who are respected in their jobs. Mm. One of the big bugbears of mine is when I hear clubs saying they don't have to pay any coaches and they are all volunteers. How is that a good thing? How will we go forward with this if people trusted to teach players aren't respected for the qualifications they have and the experience they have in the game? And that's a very good point because... In, in general, if I want to kind of, you know, show my colours here, I, I do think it should be the League of Ireland's ambition to bring the players forward in, in a structure that um, kind of can have a pyramid structure that brings like the likes of Dara Burns to play for St. Patrick's and score against Derry City in a professional, uh, you know, situation. But 
it's it's incumbent on the likes of Belvedere to develop these players, but the, the, obviously Belvedere would profit from bringing these players forward, and that's what sustains a club like Belvedere. I'm not necessarily sure that having you know powerhouses at that level around Ireland are the way to go. And as much as Belvedere um, are disenfranchised by the way the, the route the FAI is taking, I think that is kind of inevitable. You know, the League of Ireland clubs should be the clubs to bring these players forward, but it's not going to happen overnight. And we have a situation where the government really does need to be lobbied because with with Brexit, young players now up until the age of 18 cannot leave this country to go to the UK. That's enshrined in law. Um, so there is a situation where you look at uh, Omoba Medele, who's interviewed um, the, the Norwich um, sensation. He's interviewed in the Irish Times. He came through um, non-league football and bypassed the League of Ireland to go straight to Norwich. We now have a situation where he won't be able to do that. He'd have to stay in Ireland and he has to join the League of Ireland club, ideally, to be able to bring him forward. But we need money at government level. When Iceland qualified for the Euros, um, I think they they gave they gave a few million or whatever it is um, of the money that they got back into the League of Ireland or back into the Icelandic club structure. Whereas in Ireland, obviously, with the FEI, any money that we approved from these tournaments just needed to fill a hole elsewhere. So there's a bankruptcy of money in Irish football, and money will be required. But like when I'm reading a figure of seventy grand, one hundred and forty grand, we we should be just this should be just ticking boxes. That should not be big money at all at League of Ireland level. But it is because it's been bankrupt for so long. Mm. The FEI hasn't been able to give it much money, and hopefully the you know there will be people in government and in opposition parties reading this because we have a massive opportunity in this country, but we do need to to develop a football industry which we've never had yeah I agree with you I mean there'll be people listening saying hang on we've just bailed out the FAI to the tune of 30 million mm. don't, don't our tax doesn't our tax money need to go elsewhere Brendan you're taking all this it's a very good piece very nuanced the uh, the Belvedere's of the world are very sore they're very disenfranchised they're very unhappy the League of Ireland clubs are trying to get to grips with this next 10 years that's what the FAI are saying 2025 certainly actually is far less than 10 years I'm giving them 10 years they don't even want 10 years they reckon 2025 is when we'll see the fruits of all this yeah and, and look strategic plans are great and everything but but that basically leaves us with um, 14 years sorry 4 years before you know we can make any sort of judgement on it we have to go with the evidence we have now I love the symbolism of Vinnie Butler actually eating a, a rocky road as opposed to a chocolate eclair I think it's <laughs> In a graveyard. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, I feel like David bought him the Rocky Road deliberately. No, no, no I'll, I'll, I'll get it, Vinny. I'll get it. I'll get it. <laughs> it's just too good to be true, you know. But, I mean, when you look at it, when you step back from it, and it is a brilliant piece and it's well written, when you step back from it, the, the, the big take I, I, I have from it is, okay, there's, there's, there's three people, three bodies involved in it, the FAI, the school boys, and, and the League of Ireland. And we're, 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 what, six years down the road right now, nobody's happy. So what they've done is they've taken the power away from the schoolboy section, who are absolutely up in arms about it. So they are completely unhappy. Mm. And the figures you read out, Joe, about seventy to one hundred and forty grand to run four League of Ireland underage teams, given the input from UEFA and the paltry input from input from the FAI, it's clear that the League of Ireland clubs are losing money on this. I mean, they're at least fifty percent down in the money they need to do it. So they've disenfranchised and upset one body. And they've left the other completely unprepared to fill out the role that's designated for it. So that's a really, really bad situation. Had they kind of satisfied one side of it, you'd say, OK, it might have a chance of getting through. But this is a critical time. I mean, you mentioned the elections, Johnny. I think it was you that are coming up in the next month or so. Um, you know, this is culture change we're talking about here. And culture change depends on... There's very finite windows for this sort of stuff to happen. And... What happened with the exit of John Delaney and the new FAI in inverted commas, this is the chance for that to happen. Uh, Rude Doctor leaving is another kind of sticker twist moment. How does that work? So these are the days that will define it. And if it doesn't happen now in the next couple of years, like you say, Joe, we'll be here in 10 years' time and we'll be reading a David Snape piece thinking, where did it all go wrong? So it has to happen now. And given the mess that the FAI is in, given the money that isn't there, and everything else with the pandemic, it's it's like the piece, like you said about the piece, Johnny, it's a brilliant piece, but it doesn't have any answers because there aren't any easy answers as yet. And it's it's kind of discouraging to read it and kind of go, nobody clearly still six years down the line has a clear answer as to where we go. Yeah. 
Johnny, brief uh, final words. You mentioned the Andrew Amabami Delhi interview, page eight of the Sunday Times with Paul Rowan, making a real impact at Norwich. He's played the last couple of games. He'll be in the Premier League next year. Came through at League Slip. His coach, Kenny Malloy, remembers him at nine years of age. Didn't even have a pair of boots. Uh, made his way eventually over to Norwich. Uh, mother, a human rights campaigner, Mija Nivreen. Uh, father, Nigerian. I was born and raised in Ireland. My mum was... Irish 100%. They've taken care of me. I'm 100% Irish through and through. Uh, we suspect he'll be involved in Stephen Kenny's uh, summer get-together. So another promising player coming through. And there's a sidebar on a generation now of Irish players with Nigerian heritage doing great in the game. This is something that absolutely fascinates me, Joy. I wish we had uh, two hours to talk about it, really, rather than two minutes. And um, I'm obviously conscious that we have a lot to get through today. But um, I was talking to Anil Reynolds during the week, who's obviously involved in Ireland under 21. So I knew he was very much a fan of this kid. And uh, we were on the LOI Central podcast or whatever. And I said to him, what Irish players, you know, are you really looking forward to? And then I said, can you spell them? Because I knew that the names he was going to mention are not traditional Irish names mm. necessarily. And I'm over Medelli. And... Uh, has just made an unbelievable um you know impression already at the year at the age of 18 but the you know i was walking through galway city because i was down to the the galway united match on friday and as i was walking through the city on friday i i was immediately kind of greeted by you know people around their square or whatever and galway trying to you know get through the pandemic and see who's around but there were a bunch of six or seven black kids um kind of in a, in a group together and it got me thinking how these kids are integrating into society like do they integrate very easily or will it take time do black kids hang around with black kids and so on and i suppose my point is that the the sons of immigrants have made an unbelievable impact um, in football. And I, I was referencing this in relation to Bowie United as well because we had Wilson Waweru, Carlton Obazunu, Mikey Place, um, Francie Lomboto, who've all come in and made a massive impact at Bowie United. And the figures for me, because I, I, I'm, I'm trying to figure out why are these, you know, sons of Africans and sons of Nigerians and why are they making such a big impact? Because the, the figures can't be that high for these kids. And this is Paul Round's uh, piece today where he says, much of this has been driven by the economic boom and the Nigerians coming into Ireland. But it is still an extraordinary haul given there are only 17,000 resident Nigerians in the country according to the 2011 census. Now, mm -hmm. that's probably changed, but these kids are making an unbelievable impact. And this piece actually kind of looks into why they might and some of it is to do with background and that maybe they have they have to kind of prove themselves more in a society that's a little bit different for them as as a, as a black kid growing up but um our our future in Irish football is going to be so reliant on these kids and you know what the, the progress that they've made and I suppose a final point on it I, I spoke to Johnny Glynn who would have won the FEI Cup at Galway United back in 1991 this morning I was just asking him in terms of the, the sort of figures in Gaul, we said we have three kids with um, African heritage at under 19 level and five at under 17 and that's in Galway alone and every League of Ireland underage team photo that I see now you always have like a young black kid and I, I'm really really proud to see this I think the integration is something maybe that we haven't looked into that much do kids mix as freely or do they mix more by, by their background or whatever that's obviously a long story but um, you, you'll see more and more Irish teams with young black players and um, it gives me great pride to see that because I, I think it's something that um, we, we've done quite well but probably haven't really spoken enough about how well we've done it and how well integration is. Yeah, I agree with that totally. I really do. Sport is at the cutting edge of integration as well. It's one of those great arenas where it happens and we're headed towards a very multicultural uh, team and you're seeing those first generation kids come through in all facets of Irish life. You know, the arts as well. It's exploding and it's, uh, as you said, Johnny, beautiful thing. Uh, truly no place for young men. Something totally different. Don't have to spend much time on this. But I mean, if uh, the face of Irish football is changing rapidly, the face of snooker is not changing at all. Uh, this is just extraordinary. And it's a short piece. Like I said, we don't need to dwell on it. Ben Bloom in the uh, Telegraph. Basically, the uh, World Championships are starting and it's all the same names. Uh, so he says, tennis is Federer and Williams. Uh, football is Ibrahimovic. American football is Tom Brady. But for ageing talent to find their years, there is no rival to snooker. He says, attempting to predict the winner of the World Championship is not only an almost identical task to a decade ago, but remarkably, it's not too dissimilar from the turn of the century. Uh, Ronnie O'Sullivan, who first won the title in 01, is a top seed. John Higgins, the man he beat 20 years ago, is ranked number five. Neil Robertson, Mark Williams, Sean Murphy, Mark Selby, Stephen Maguire, Barry Hawkins were also present in 01 and are still among the game's top 12. 
players. Right now, snooker truly is no sport for young men. Just one player in the world's top 16, a 21-year-old, has turned professional in the past decade. One player who's turned pro in the past decade is in the world's top 16. The class of 92, O'Sullivan's, Higgins and Williams are approaching their 30th anniversary as a, a pro on tour. So, uh, pretty extraordinary. Now, they are all saying, Brendan, Judd Trump is saying it and Barry Hearn is saying it. They're saying in 10 years' time, at least half of the top 16 will be Chinese, that that is coming. Barry Hearn says that. But, like, for the last 20 years, you were on fairly safe ground, Tib and Ronnie. <laughs> You certainly were. I mean, there's, there's a few obvious things to say here. You know, playing snooker is not the same as playing quarterback in American football or, or a tight head prop in rugby. Um, you know, you might get a touch of tennis elbow from from raising the glass of water. But um, it is quite astonishing for, for a sport to have this kind of consistency. And, of course, this comes in the back of Ronnie O'Sullivan's claims last year about um, the dearth of talent coming true. And in true Ronnie O'Sullivan talent, uh, fashion, he, he basically went in with a two-foot tackle on the youngsters. And then following that, if you remember, Cork's Aaron Hill beat him in, um, I have it written here, is it the European Masters. So, you know, there is a bit of background to this, but it is quite astonishing. And, you know, snooker hasn't changed. I mean, it's it's still refreshingly the same sport that we all tuned into when Dennis Taylor won back in the day. Uh, nothing much has changed about it from, from a visual setting, you know, a few gimmicks aside, but... Um, you know, it is in for a sea change. And it could be actually fascinating when, I mean, we've seen with a number of the Asian players coming through in the last even 20 years. I mean, this isn't a new thing. It's been it's been coming. But when when that balance of power does tip in the manner they're talking about here, I mean, what impact will that have in the sport in terms of, um, you know, the, the viewership is already quite old. They've mentioned it in the piece as well. So it's just a, a fact of life that if you're turning on the snooker, and there's players from the UK and Ireland, you, you're more inclined to watch it than if it is, you know, eight or ten of the top 16 guys from China. There, there's just less familiarity with that. There's mm-hmm. cultural reasons for that. Um, so it will be interesting to see what snooker does to to um, not combat that, to kind of embrace that and, and use it to their advantage. Going. Well, if the idea has been thrown out here, are, are all we have to go on then I think they're in trouble because uh, Jud, yeah. Jud Trump says maybe we could change the way we dress to make it a bit more appealing teenagers don't want to be stuck wearing a dinner suit to play snooker like I'm not sure that's going to get it done I guess Johnny the way uh, snooker might look at it is well if 8 of the top 16 in 10 years are Chinese that's a billion eyeballs we suddenly have snooker will be bigger than ever it just won't be here Absolutely yeah um, and uh, I, I think that probably is I think in terms of Judd Trump's thing, it's maybe like changing the colour of your car. If you know the engine doesn't work, I don't think it's going to make much difference to the product. Um, but it, it's fascinating. I mean, and when Ronnie is gone, and if, if Ronnie ceases to become kind of relevant, it'll be interesting to see how um, sport, how the sport in Britain and Ireland kind of progresses because it's... it's um, I think one of the issues with this is, and I, I think cricket may have, have a problem with it as well, is just people's attention spans and their ability to watch something so long with so little happening. And it's a problem in racing as well. I mean, why would people go to a race meeting when in half an hour the sport takes place over a minute and a half? You know, So it, this is going to be a big issue. People don't have the attention span to sit down and watch a football game without spending half of the game on WhatsApp or on Twitter talking about it. Just don't have the attention span anymore. These are probably people in their 30s and 40s. So whether the kids are tomorrow have the attention span to watch a snooker match that takes place over two days is something that uh, I can't answer. No, it's true. It is, it's always striking, I find, Brendan, lately when you're flicking around on your phone and you've got your laptop open and you're channel hopping and suddenly you come to a game of snooker it's like time is standing still like you have to almost resubmerge back into this pace of life so I don't know I mean would you sit there and watch but then again if you if you get into it and you get a really good snooker match I mean the reward is there but getting into it's tricky but I find that Joe even if you expand that out if it comes to a Wimbledon or a Tour de France or some of the say minority sports yeah. that we golf and- very true golf as well Golf, golf is a perfect example. For me personally, if I don't get into those tournaments on day one, I cannot get into them at all. So if the Tour de France and Sam Bennett is doing something, I couldn't pick up on it last year. I just couldn't get involved. It's the same with Wimbledon. For whatever reason, I miss the start of it every year. And I just can't get myself into that place. And that happens on a, a microscopic level every time you put on a football match or a rugby game. I think, you know, I've got into the habit of just putting the phone in a different room it has to be done mm. like Johnny mentioned mm. cricket cricket fan I mean 
you know, God be with the days when you were a student or whatever, you could actually spend five days watching the cricket. And even sports like snooker have looked at, le- at ways of, like cricket, a shorter version of the game, of making it more um, amenable to the younger audience and to the two-screen audience. But it's a very delicate balance because, you know, how much of the, the product do you take away by trying to make it, um, you know, 21st century friendly? So, you know, there's no, like the FAI, there's no, there's no easy answers. Yeah, to it's in a bunch of sports, even rugby. Yeah. The, fir- the first three minutes, four minutes yesterday of the match at Donnybrook, it was just like scrums being reset. Yeah. It's Very so bad. dull. And there's time to watch Pro 14 and it's just scrums being reset. I was talking to Matt Williams about this. He says down around Australia and New Zealand, the TV companies are so much better, as in they have packages ready to go for those minutes where scrums are being re- reset. So you get lots of brilliant slow motion replays and the TV companies make up the shortfall in that sport. Mm. We need to look at that here. But uh, yeah, I don't know, Johnny. I mean, it's amazing football has stayed as popular as ever because I find 90 minutes tough going now unless it's a cracking game. Well, that's alarming because um, football is the, the sport and I, I think um, I mean we're, we're probably somewhere around the bracket of middle age men are we? We're getting there Very We're getting much. there um, so what about the kids who've been brought up on their phones you know which I wasn't in fairness my first smartphone was you know, a few years ago my first mobile phone was when I was 19 but the kids who've been brought up through social media and been on their phone much of the day um, are they able to watch uh, a League of Ireland game for 90 minutes Probably a bit of a struggle. Mm, yeah, I don't know. I will uh, I will often now hit pause at kickoff, wait 15, 20 minutes and then hit play and then you zip through uh, the ball being out of play. It that's t- not good. So that's like watching, you know, when people used to watch the American football games the following day because they could flick through the ads. Yeah. Or, you know, maybe the housewife who wants to watch her show now but she, she won't watch it live because she's just so annoyed by the ads that yeah. she can watch it the next day and she can get her salacious gossip or whoever, you know. But it's like, you know, I, I, I'm always minded of Tommy Tiernan when um, Luke Ming Flanagan got him to, when back in the day when, you know, Ming was like a kind of a joke politician before he actually became the powerhouse that he is and he, he wanted to do a bit of a fundraiser in Galway so he got Tommy Tiernan to organise um, a, a comedy you know, a uh, gig for, for Ming's supporters and to raise a few bob. And Tommy Tiernan was like thinking, what what would Ming's supporters be like in those days? And he said, they were probably at home on the couch smoking, watching the snooker. <laughs> I was like, I wonder could they watch it now? Yeah. Well, so that's, uh, how do we get on to that? Oh yeah, snooker. Sorry, yeah, we were on snooker. We were on snooker. So that's uh, page 21, or page 19 of the Sunday Independent. There's lots of horse racing coverage, Johnny, across the papers, I guess, as a racing journalist. You're happy to see this. There's Tommy Conlon paying tribute to Rachel Blackmore. David Walsh is looking at how Irish racing is leaving English racing in the shade and not coming up with easy answers. And I know you like Dennis Walsh as well, talking to another female jockey, Sarah Kavanagh in the uh, Sunday Times. So what do you want to give us here? Or what do you want to say here? Yeah, I like we never even mentioned, you know, in the we have the Sunday Indo here in the, the, the front cover. Um, we have basically the, the Simply Out class or whatever. But I, I think it, the fact that, Joe, you didn't even mention that, you know, an Ireland women's rugby game is by far the biggest story um, in terms of how female sport is progressing. You didn't even bear that worthy of a mention. That's an indication of where we've gotten with this. And Do you know what part of that is, Johnny? I'm I'm just not doing that anymore. I'm just mm. and I, I'm not having a female like I'm just talking about the sport now. I'm not doing the what does this mean conversation unless it absolutely yeah. has to be had. I just I'm just so sick of it. And I d I don't think people I don't think it's the way to interest people in sport. In in no. female sport. Like if we keep talking about oh is like the way to come on was not to talk about how great it was. The way it was to come on and talk about how rubbish Ireland were, and yeah. that's that's where we need to get to. Because I just I just don't find it, I just find it so dull. These these it's the same hackneyed conversation again and again and again. And well, like it, if she can't see it, she can't be it. It's great and everything, but we you know we're, we're there now. We're getting there. It's but it's this has been dramatic. So we have uh, the the fact that you know this wouldn't have been the case a few years ago, where you know you would have and then Orla Dwyer's um, performances in in Australia as well getting good coverage. But Rachel Blackmore's thing is very interesting because she is a reluctant kind of ambassador yeah. for feminism or whatever you want. And I was actually speaking to Lisa Fallon in Galway yesterday. Um, 
just about something else and I was, I was talking about coaching and we were both agreeing that we need to get on from this but I think I think we're very much there and R- Rachel Blackmore is is a perfect example of um, just getting on with it really and you know the, the, the progress she has made Tommy Conlon has a lovely piece mm. um, where he talks about her, her progress and it's it's it references the T.G. Carhart uh, documentary, Jumps Girls, where she says, a trainer, she says, and this is Rachel talking in 2019, might decide, I don't want her on that horse. She's a girl, blah, blah, blah. But another trainer might decide, no, I think I would like a girl in this horse. I think a girl might make a bit of a difference. So it completely balances out, you know. But for me, the, the most interesting article on this is uh, by Rebecca Myers in The Times because she talks about the fact that um, female jockeys might actually be better equipped uh, than male jockeys in many respects. And then there's an interview with Sarah Kavanagh, and this emphasizes the fact that it's just very, very difficult for young jockeys full stop in Ireland. There are a large milieu of jockeys who are struggling for a small number of winners, and it's, it's not really relevant whether they're male or female. It's just that the main jockeys in Ireland, they win the vast majority of the races and there are only um, four jockeys in Ireland female jockeys with professional license Rachel Blackmore um, Emma Toomey Sarah Kavanagh and Aileen O'Sullivan so we have a long long way to go but uh, racing is getting a lot of coverage and I think Rachel Blackmore has had a big role in this um, and then we have David Walsh talking in the Times about British trainers seek to answers to Irish dominance this is just quite stark I think it's even if you have no interest in racing um that year, 1981, there were 39 runners in the national. Seven were Irish trained. Senator McClory was the best for them, finishing seventh. And this year, uh, there were 40 runners. 18 were Irish trained, and they made up 10 of the first 11. So British racing has some major, major soul-seeking, and there's been a lot of coverage in the Racing Post this week about why we are absolutely battering the British in racing, and they don't have the answer. And is there no generally agreed answer, no? Because David Walsh didn't have one as such either. Like, he was even saying, if you look at the sales of the last while, you know, of horses sold for 100 grand, 79 were sent to the UK, 61 to Ireland... 12.6 12.6 million was spent on horses that stayed in the UK, 11.7 million on horses that stayed in Irish yards. You know, he was even making the point Manella Times was first bought for 31 grand or whatever. So he wasn't necessarily saying, well, we can't say this is down to money spent on buying horses. I know the prize money is better in Ireland and that's been used as a reason. I'm not sure it fully explains it. What's your sense of why Ireland is absolutely destroying British racing at the moment? It's probably a bit like that football piece. Like, there isn't one simple answer, but to me, there are definitely some answers. You know, at the bottom of the piece, David says, consider what the reaction would be if the English Raiders turned up at Punchestown and did as well as the Irish at the most recent Cheltenham. That would mean 33 of Punchestown's 40 races being won by the visitors. Mm -hmm. Um, That won't happen because the British won't even come over. They're so afraid of us. But he references Belfast Banter. Now, in in Friday Night Racing on Friday, we had Peter Fahey, who trains Belfast Banter. We had him on the show. And he made the point that Belfast fast banter was sold back to Ireland because after finishing placed and winning a bumper in Britain he barely covered his month's training fees and training um, fees are sorry his training fees are so expensive in Britain you might have a bumper run for sort of two and a half grand if you take 25% off that then you take the cost of travelling to the races the cost of giving a few bob to the stable hand there's basically no money left and this is with the horse who's winning right. so it's completely uneconomical to have a horse in Britain at the moment and I'd probably add the fact that a bit like Kenny Hurler has brought up the standard of hurling because Maybe the likes of Tip Galway, Limerick, Clare and so on had to you know, raise their standards to get there. I think what Willie Mullins and Gordon Elliott did, they brought up you know, standards to a huge, huge level in Ireland that you had to get your horse to a certain level of fitness. Um, you maybe had to up your game. Peter Fry spoke about this, but what hasn't been mentioned in the whole Rachel Blackmore thing, Joe, is Henry de Bromhead has had an absurdly good yeah. year where he's had the first two in the Gold Cup, the first two in the Grand National, the champion hurdle, and the champion chase. And as much as Rachel Blackman was pivotal to much of that, Henry de Bromhead has raised his standards because he needed to, to compete with these two. And whereas in Britain we have, you know, we have Paul Nichols, who's probably on the wane compared to what he was. Nicky Henderson is getting on a bit and clearly not the force he was. And after that, the trainers just aren't there. The best trainers, the best horse, and the best jockeys are basically in Ireland. And that's not going to change in the near future. Right, OK. It's, in, it's interesting as well. I, I covered the Cheltenham Festival for about nine years in a row, started about 08, 09, and that was the height, the height of the, the Den Mania, Imperial Commander, Star, and all these guys, and the, the, the football scars and everything. And I, I remember back then, there was no sense of, I, I, you know, maybe I'm misremembering this, but 
I, I, I clearly remember pieces and conversations about the possibility of Ireland beating Great Britain in, in whatever they call that cup, the Presbury Cup, Presbury, at the time yeah. it was half off. So that's only 10 or 12 years ago. And you mentioned as well, Johnny, I mean, you know, the Paul Nichols back then was obviously winning gold cups. Nicky Henderson was maybe the height of his powers, but it, it seems to have flipped very suddenly. But, like, I'd be interested in your take on it, Johnny. I mean, one of the conversations in Irish racing is that, you know, the big yards, the big trainers and the amount of winners they have. I'd love to see the breakdown of, of the winners from Willie Mullins, Gordon Elliott and now Henry de Bromhead. Because isn't that an issue in Irish racing as well, that there's plenty of trainers on the Irish side of the Irish sea that just can't keep up with those guys? Absolutely. And uh, I think you could probably extrapolate on that and say if you want to get people involved in racing now, they might be more inclined to get involved with the flat horse um, because they feel that they'll be able to at least compete and they have Dundalk. And it's very, very hard to compete with to win a maiden hurdle in Ireland is, is almost next to impossible for a lot of trainers. And that's another issue in terms of the dominance of those trainers. And I think National Hunt, in terms of its kind of spirit and, you know, the grassroots level of it, it's not particularly well geared towards dominance by any one individual. I think you want the, the late Tom Foley and the only, you want those horses that will capture the mood of a nation. Um, and I think Rachel Blackmore has probably captured the mood of a nation, but whether horses do it as much as they did in the days when, you know, um, it was a proper underdog sport, that's another question because we can probably, the sport could be a, a victim of its success in Ireland in the sense that we don't want it to become too dominant. But the bottom line is here, we absolutely, we absolutely absolutely need British racing to be strong. We need it in terms of our exports, we need it in terms of competition, and we need it in terms of the market. And British racing being in a bad way is not good at all for Irish racing, and Brexit will raise further questions in that regard. And as much as the Grand National got a huge uh, TV audience, how much is the British public's attitude to racing with an increasingly urban environment, with an increasing you know, concern about animal welfare, how... how strong will racing be in 10 or 20 years full stop with horses dying in jumps races and so forth I don't know but the trends are very very worrying mm. The Rachel Blackmore story is interesting as well in terms of that media kind of space that they hold I think because you know even in the years I was covering Cheltenham um, you know another Willie Mullins win another uh, Gordon Elliott win you know another win for um, the O'Briens or whatever and, and every time a major trainer was winning I was there as a kind of a colour reporter so I was looking for the you know the underdog story that you talk about Johnny and you get to the seventh race in the day and it'd be all Willie Mullins or Gordon Elliott or Henry de Bromhead and you're kind of scratching around and you've had AP McCoy go you've had Ruby Walsh go you talked about the animal welfare thing so the racial Blackmore um, story even when you take away the the, the you know, the fact that she's a woman, it's a new personality coming into the game, which Absolutely. I think is racing, and it really does need that. I think... Well, I think I there's, say, a, there's a palpable sense of relief almost, isn't there? Like, yeah, there's, there's yeah. Cheltenham last year with the COVID stuff, there's the Gordon Elliott story, there's yeah. the doping issue, which has is really blown up now. I mean, you mentioned it, Johnny, it's been a bad old time for racing, and so there is a palpable sense of relief that a Rachel Blackmore emerges in the last couple of months. Yeah, because on that, um, you know, Rachel, the reluctant um, ambassador for women in racing or whatever, just I, I would implore people to get the times and read Rebecca Myers' piece because it paints a picture of a future where female jockeys are going to be much, much more prevalent. Maybe you see it a bit in the flat now, but it actually goes into the background why why this may be the case. And there's even a, a line from Professor Greg White, an expert in sports site, uh, physiology and former director of research for the British Olympic Association, Women tend to bring less bravado and tend to make better decisions on things like pacing. And I thought that was a really, really interesting angle that lads are too, they're, they're too kind of cocky and competent and female riders are more chilled out and they're kind of um, happy to take their time. But it also breaks down bone structure and um, you know, stuff that goes into the, the, the muscles in the body, muscle mass and all that. And why we could have a future where there'll be a lot more female riders and whatever we say about, you know, and I completely agree with you that it's, we don't want to be talking about female um, sports people on the front pages anymore. If racing is to survive, if we can have almost some sort of parity between female riders and male riders, that'll be a massive, massive help because it'll make it more interesting for a lot of people. Yeah, absolutely. Clock's coming against us, so I'll, I'll race through this. It's just worth a mention. Liverpool play Leeds tomorrow night. 
Nat Phillips is a name very few of us were familiar at the start of the season and now he's growing into the role at Liverpool. I, I like him a hell of a lot more after this interview with Jonathan Northcroft, I would say. He comes across really well. Uh, too low-key to be on Twitter. His answer is, I don't think I've got anything that interesting to say to be tweeting. <laughs> that would give you a sense of where Nat Phillips is. Uh, this guy was on the verge of going to do a degree in geography and economics. He was due to fly out to play over in the States and, ha- and do um, collegiate kind of thing there. And then Liverpool realised he'd been released. I think it was from Bolton. And so they invited him on trial. And he played a little bit. He had a stress fracture in his back. He went on loan at Stuttgart and then he came back and he was pretty much sure he was going to be released and so he started just enjoying himself at training. He said, I was properly wrapping my passes or making them with my laces, having the confidence to shell it or drag it or slice it and they were coming off and Northcroft says here, it enabled him to show his ability on the ball, perhaps the one area where Klopp had doubts about his game and you know, he's kind of come in and he's growing into it. Like he says at the Real Madrid game I could have done better with that ball over the top to Vinicius in the first leg, but I washed it back. I was half a second too late. I realised I needed to drop. In the second leg, I was alert to it. As soon as their centre-backs got time on the ball to pick their heads up, we dropped to be in position to defend them. And he's talking about learning all the time. And again, in a very likeable kind of way, he says, the boss sees himself in me. First division brain, third division feet. Um, That's a great line. <laughs> which is really good. So Klopp seems to really like him and they, they get a sense he's learning and he seems to have his head really screwed on. Yeah, did you want to take that one, Bryn? Yeah, no, he's, he's an interesting guy. It's funny that you mentioned Real Madrid game because um, it's funny about, you know, perception is a very funny thing because every time he did something, I felt I was looking at him through the lens of uh, a Bolton Wanderers defender. Mm. I, I found it was being far more critical of him. And he mentioned that goal and the positioning and I was like, yeah, Bolton Wanderers defender. You know, it's funny because we have this kind of, um, you know, we're, we're, we're used to now players not coming through this kind of avenue to the top of the game anymore. And I was thinking as well, watching during the week of like, you go back to the day, Ian Rush coming from Chester City and stuff like that. It just doesn't seem to happen anymore. And obviously they're very different, different routes. I mean, Ian Rush was clearly a guy who had a, you know, he was destined for the top. But guys coming from that lower level, it's kind of a Royal Rover story that we don't see anymore. Um, so it's it's an interesting one in that. And, you know, you'd wonder what's going to be the future from when, when the three other lads get back fit. Um, yeah. But, I mean, he's done everything he has at the moment. And Klopp seems to be, I mean, what else can Klopp say? He has to he has to bolster the guy, especially if confidence was an issue going back in the day. But um, it's a great story. Yeah, it is. It, to... it doesn't, as you say, it doesn't happen as well. And the, the thing you met about, the point you met about Twitter, Joe, where he's too low key for Twitter, I did mean to say this. I looked up, I wasn't sure if Rachel Blackmore had a Twitter account either, because that is just not her style. And like, I've done interviews with Rachel Blackmore where she is not easy to deal with. She really wants like to, to the message to to kind of, I suppose, portray her in the best possible light, but she is really single-minded and I, I grew a lot of respect for her because she'd be conscious of what goes into issues and she's like, if I'm doing this, I want to do it properly, but uh, she's had two tweets all year, one of them was in, sorry, two tweets in the la- since the start of February, so she's had no tweets since 20th of February and her last tweet effectively was remember Jack Tyner, the, the late writer on February 6th, Twitter just isn't for her and the Nat Phillips thing, I just don't have anything interesting to say. I think a lot of people including myself when I was on Twitter we could learn from that because a lot of the time you just don't have anything to say no generally yeah. Twitter's just bored journalists isn't it yeah <laughs> it's an hour thing it is yeah uh, phenomenal fella on page 14 of the Sunday Times Keith Higgins like one of the truly great footballers 16 seasons with Mayo 90 appearances in the league 75 in the championship more than any other player around this time and really and the picture's great. It's Dennis Walsh here with the interview. Really, it has Keith Higgins looking adoringly at his hurl because as brilliant as he was at football, really, he just wanted to be a hurler and has been a hurler the whole way through. His father, Peter, a hurling fanatic from Mount Bellew in Galway. So basically, the story, Brendan, here is, I know you picked this out and you really liked it. Uh, Higgins has played since, what, 02 when he came through as a 17-year-old. Matty Murphy picked at him and then and said he's one of the best young hurlers in the country one of the best young hurlers in the country and played Railway Cup and everything else. But uh, obviously football took um, precedence in our minds, but he was still playing away with Mayo. He was a dual player. He was missing 
you know, he's sometimes playing two games a weekend and uh, basically he'd retired from the football as we know and he'd retired from the hurling and he's after getting a phone call and they've twisted his arm. So 36 years of age on Tuesday night coming, Keith Higgins goes back to train with the Mayo Hurlers for his 19th season. Yeah, and, and what struck me reading it, Joe, was, you know, God, the dual player thing. I've written about it far too many times down the years as well. And um, But we always see it through the prism of the strong counties or at the very least a leash or an awfully, you know, one of the mid-range counties in, in both sports. So, yeah, OK, dual, dual player. But, you know, I mean, uh, Dennis talks about um, Keith's dual role status and, and the, the start of it is perfect. You know, the way the way Dennis talks about it, um, you know, people who had never seen him play accepted he was brilliant. <laughs> Thurston went uncontested for so long that nobody questioned it or doubted it, it was true. I'd never seen Keith Higgins play play hurling. Same. It, it, you know, that's it. So but I always accepted it as like this guy's a phenomenal hurler, you know. Something you drop into the mm. conversation over a pint in the pub, like, Yeah, he's a better hurler than he's a footballer. <laughs> oh yeah. And, you know, you have that, that position of authority over it. But it's just an astonishing story that a guy like Matty Murphy, who was, you know, so... Um, Matty Murphy is a, is a big hurling man, knows his hurling. For him to say he was in the top young hurlers at the time, this is in a county, as Dennis explains, where there are currently four hurling clubs, never more than six. You know, um, the, much of Mayo is a wasteland for hurling. I have a brother living up in Westport, and um, I found myself up there the odd weekend off during the summer and uh, there might be, a, you know, some Wimbledon might be on or something or a World Cup pool game between Ghana and Iceland or something and there could be a big hurling game on and you'd have to go from one end of the town to the other to find any bar with the hurling on. So it's, it's you know, it's just not a conducive environment mm. for somebody to be a top level hurler. But, I mean, I think you're right in pointing out the photo as well. The photo really sums it up. It's It's, you know... If that was his daughter or his wife or something, you know, you yeah. kind of go and see it. But it's just like, you know, after all this time being, you know, being known as the footballer, he can he can give back um, a little bit of time to the hurling. So it's a lovely story. Yeah, find someone we who looks at you the way Keith Higgins looks at the hurling and all that. <laughs> yeah. We might get a chance to talk about Joe Raleigh's feats, you know, yes, where he's talking about East Belfast. I was just going to bring it up, um, actually. So to, to sum this kind of up, so um, there's no Paul Kimmich then Sunday in the pen. There's a lot of lines and there's the rugby and then there's uh, there's Neil Francis and there's Joe Brawley. I would say you get the slightly pessimistic versus the more positive outlook, Johnny. Uh, Neil Francis is saying, you know, the theory that Ulster can be good for Ireland qualified players is built on a guarantee of social stability and... He talks, you know, with worry as we all have about the situation up there and there are 13 players in the squad who are uh, Republic born and they've gone up there. A lot of Leinster players have gone up there and, you know, he says uh, the only cloud in the horizon is a sustained return to violence. If that happens, all bets are off. And two pages later, you have Joe Brawley and, and we had um, a couple of the members of this club from East Belfast GA Club on a while back talking about how, well, it's I mean, it's just the most amazing initiative it's about community it's about it's you know east belfast and you have people there from protestant unionist backgrounds who don't know a thing about ga getting involved in the club and and that is very much their aim i mean <laughs> to to capture the most grim aspect of maybe the last couple of weeks johnny there, he has a quote towards the end when a reporter was asked or sorry a reporter asked a, a one of the young rioters why he was rioting and he told him <laughs> because they won't let us bury Bobby's story, end yeah. quote, uh, which just shows, you know, the ignorance that's been harnessed by cynical old men up there. And uh, But but East Belfast GA, like Brawley makes the point effectively in his piece, Belfast's a beautiful place and it's a safe place and that's not going to change. Yeah, it's uh, there, there, there are sort of links between the Keith Higgins thing and the Joe Brawley article because Keith Higgins talks about, you know, trying to get hurling going in Mayo. And for me, the GA has has failed in in, in the sense of getting hurling um, played around the country because hurling is basically the greatest field sport in the world and it's ours. And we can't sell it to areas like Mayo. Um, and now we have a situation where 
hurling's in East Belfast and football's in East Belfast. I think the other failing of the GA has been to sell it to the Protestant community in the north because it's basically a scandal how few Protestants in Northern Ireland play Gaelic games. And I've been on the show about this before. I'm not exactly sure what the answer is. I think, you know, we have an anachronistic sort of um, nationalism um, and flag-waving maybe in, in, in Gaelic games that was, you know, belonging to a time when we, we needed to assert ourselves in the time of British rule, and that's how the GA was founded, but is now completely outdated, and I think we need to attract people from different backgrounds, and maybe GA has failed in terms of getting those mixed-race kids that soccer has. So there are all these things that, that um, you know, the GA has to has to work with. And if I just go back to the... Um, very briefly to the to the Higgins article, which is a beautiful article by Dennis Walsh. Bernie Madoff obviously passed away during the week. This was a line that I thought was was amazing. Really, there are four adult hurling teams in the county now, and in Higgins' time, there have never been more than six. As the hurling championship became more heavily stratified, Mayo dropped to the fourth tier, while the footballers invested their supporters' hearts in a variety of Ponzi schemes. The hurlers had no access to such funds. That's a staggering line about um, you know the, the a place like Mayo where it's all football 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 and Keith Higgins as an outlier who loves hurling his dad is from Mount Bellew which is more or less where I'm from which incidentally itself is a football area not really a hurling area Joe Bergen country and so forth Um, so hurling in North Galway wouldn't be that strong but we, we do have these pockets where, like Ballygar, where, where these um, kind of hurling clubs thrive. But the Joe Brawley piece, um, obviously Neil Francis talks about as well, talks about travelling through the north on the 12th. Somehow Neil Francis didn't realise it was the 12th of July. That seems to be the premise of the start the piece, which I find absolutely amazing. I mean, we've all seen the episode of Derry Girls, but if you're in the north of July, in the twe- if you're in the north on 12th of July, you'd probably realise it's 12th of July. But Frano didn't, and he had to be told by a cop that he'd probably better go home via Sligo. And he you know what, of, you anyway, know what, that, though, that I would be exactly exactly the same I'd be up there and it, I just it's just not my world it's just never something I gave a blind bit of heed to if I was stopped up there and someone says 12th of July I'd, it would take me a few seconds to realise what they're getting at I don't know what world you live in. Although, as Frano says, I live in this my, is my, my island, my it's world. not my country. Yeah, <laughs> Frano says something like, it's it's my island, but this is a different country or something like that, which is a fair enough line. But if ever there were a piece made for Joe Brawley, it's something like this, going to East Belfast. And you mentioned, Joe, you know, the, the, the stuff about Bobby's story. I was talking to... Um, couple of guys in the north this week about David Irvine because David Irvine's loss to loyalism and, and loyalist kind of working class communities has been massive. The DUP does not really represent working class loyalism and you get these situations where you have kids who don't really know what they're fighting for, you know, putting buses on fire and David Irvine's um, sister-in-law, Linda Irvine, would have been really pivotal in a really unlikely revival of the Irish language in Belfast but even that I think pales in comparison to the story of the East Belfast GA Club it has Ulster Scots English and Irish on its crest um, it has people who didn't even know what a GA pitch looked like playing camogie and football for the first time it is a beautiful beautiful story and it's brilliantly written by Joe Brawley uh, uh, in page 12 of the Indo and I think it definitely um, it's one of these pieces that'll just put you in good form after a couple of weeks that wouldn't put you in good form about the future of Northern Ireland Absolutely and and not without its challenges Brendan I know we spoke to one of the founders last summer there'd been a bomb threat and so idiots in the community were trying to destabilise it but they haven't managed to to do it or haven't been successful. Uh, Dave McGreevy here says, we don't care about religion, traditional politics. We don't ask who you are or what you are. This is about people getting to know each other and building communities. In the end, that's the only thing that really matters. Yeah, and what I like about, um, one of the things I like about the the Joe Brawley piece is is the perspective that he gives it. Like, he doesn't shy over over the the background to all this. Mm. There's a quite sizable um, chunk of the article towards the end where he goes into... Um, basically the ethnic cleansing that happened in the Harland and Wolves shipyards back in the day um, of Catholic workers or any, what's the phrase he used of um, um, rotten prods, Protestants who would have been sympathetic towards their Catholic counterparts. Um, you know, people be, basically being run out of the shipyards, jumping into the river to get away. I mean, you know, we've, we've seen uh, things like that escalate um, in, in Europe in the 20th century to, to greater degrees as well. And he also had a, a story which I'd never heard about um, when he talks about his mother was the mayor of Lima Vadi. She turned on the Christmas tree lights in the Burnfoot, causing great upset in the Loy- Loyalist village. She was heckled as she made a speech about peace and the importance of Christ's message. And no sooner had her back been turned than a local man emerged with a chainsaw and to huge cheers, 
go to 30 foot tree to the ground, ruining it and smashing the coloured lights. That's almost 20 years ago, he says, matter of fact. That's the 21st century, you know, that's 2000 and something. Yeah. So it's a, it's, it's a very good perspective. And yet, like you say, Joe, this is a very positive piece. And he's he's basically saying we're not going back to those days. I mean, those days are gone. And, you know, we've all seen the news coverage of, of the, the, the youngsters in the hoodies and the not so youngsters in the hoodies and the burning bus. Um, but Brawley, who lives in Belfast, I believe, still... Um, his his case is, you know, we're not going back to those days. And East Belfast Club is a great example of it. And East Belfast, of course, Tiger Bay and all that, with Carl Frampton, who had his fight there a couple of years ago, is another great example of somebody who has that, just that knowledge and that common decency to kind of, you know, make little but a lot of the fact that he will wear, you know, a Northern Ireland jersey one day and an Antrim GA top the other. And, you know, as we know in Northern Ireland, symbolism is, is so important. And Johnny touched on that as well with the GA's kind of background as well. And I found it interesting in, in, in recent weeks, we we're not far beyond the 50th anniversary of the, the scrapping of the ban on foreign games. I was kind of disappointed that we didn't see more, more of it in, in the media and maybe from the GA itself. And maybe the pandemic had something to do with that. But, you know, I thought it was a good opportunity for the GA community to kind of look back on on what was, maybe it's the fact that the band was on its way out through much of the 60s, but um, I just think maybe we could have a, another look at where we've come, for, come from and the element of flags and all that and national anthems and the naming of GA grounds is another potential sort of, not, is a sore spot for, for people in, in the Protestant community who might want to get involved in, in the game, but I, I'm also wary of the fact that I'm a uh, a southern um, Irishman, and I don't really know a whole lot about that and, mm. and the sensitivities on the ground. Yeah. Fellas, really enjoyed that. We're out of time. Johnny Ward, racing journalist, Brendan O'Brien, and the Irish Examiner. Thanks so much, guys. Appreciate it. Cheers, Thanks, guys. Joe. The Sunday Papers on Off the Ball.